So here we are. It's uh, Monday. I don't know how many Mondays we have left, but it's Monday the uh, 29th. We're at class number 21 of Packet 5. Packet 5 is starting to come to an end. Today we'll be talking about Hooke's Law. We'll be talking about duck walking. We'll just get into that. Uh, we did a dino hunt today. This is the day, though, for virtual kids. So if you're in class, you could have got up to three dinos today if you'd watched the sun and help video and you worked number five. I don't think number five would be tough without watching that sun and help video. In class, I did a, uh, I had them raise their hand if they'd watched and they're honest, you know. And so we had 18 students out of about 60, I have about 60 kids that are um, in person. So about a third watched the help video. It's, that's not bad. It's for homework. Now, for you all, let me get my final numbers here. Uh, give me a thumbs up and don't, don't be honest now. Don't, not gonna hurt my feelings. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you watch the silent, at least a minute of it, or at least 30 seconds of it, the silent help video that went along with number five. Now give me a thumbs up, two, three. Okay, so I'll add three more. So now we're up to uh, 21 out of 70, oh, four, 22 out of uh, 73, I think we have in class. All right. Um, it was a beautiful day yesterday. I don't blame you for not doing it, but really you all could have not done it and still been fine. Um, yours is due though, 5-8 is due tonight. Uh, you have to uh, you start getting kind of late. It's only 5% of the day, but you'll start getting counting late after midnight tonight. So, um, submit that on there is a spot on canvas to submit it and it's worth i think 20 points but on there i wrote you a note that i'll give you up to 30 out of 20. so if you do the whole thing have it all done you'll get a 10 point bonus uh tacked on if you did a good job i mean you did thorough work and all so i i, I have the chance because because you guys in class they get extra points some of them do some of them do uh, because they do extra extra dinosaur stamps. You all don't get that chance. So now I'm going to give you a chance to get 30 out of 20 on this uh, if you'll turn it in tonight. Okay, now if you turn it in after tonight, you don't get any chance of bonus and you're going to start losing points. Okay, so if you're watching and you're in person, that's not, that doesn't pertain to you, it's only virtual. And there's the problem I'm talking about, but really you need to check out the SHV. It's in the Facebook group under comments. Uh, it's on the YouTube channel. I don't think you'll find it in Canvas because I stopped putting all those. I started running out of room. Anyway, number five, it's a challenging problem. Uh, tonight for you all, tonight I'll have a PDF available for Oh, you know what I forgot to do? Hold on, back, 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 back. I got involved in this too fast. Let's look at the calendar. That's last week. Last week, you submitted your Blue Day points. I don't think anybody came to my porch, but you submitted your Blue Day work for packet 5A. Um, that is, I need to grade that either tonight or tomorrow. I had to have my grades in weekly. Uh, Tuesday is the big deadline. I had to have my grades in by Tuesday at midnight. I don't have to have them in, but that's where eligibility starts Wednesday morning. So they check the, they pull those grades, not from Canvas, but from Infinite Campus, and they pull those grades and they check for eligibility. So I will have these grades in by, at the latest, tomorrow night at midnight. I'm not getting them tonight. It's really not much that last week. Here's this week. Let's see what's happening here. We're wrapping up March. Yay. I can't believe it's almost April. No fool, man. April 1st is Thursday. It's crazy. Well, tonight, I'm going to have the PDF available uh, starting at 7. I think I should be able to make that deadline. It might be 7.30, but it'll be right around there. I'll have the PDF available for take-home test packet 5, so take-home test 5B. Um, I'll hand it out to you and to them. If you want to come by the porch, it'll be available on the 30th if you don't have a printer or whatever. Um, 30th, uh, you can come by the porch, pick up a copy. Uh, someone said, well, you should have it available at school too. Uh, well, 
yeah, it's always available in my classroom. You want to come on my classroom? I'll give it to you. But well, let's have a place in the front office. No, man. I mean, this. It, why would you just come to my porch? I mean, it doesn't make sense. Um, so anyway, available in my room or on my porch tomorrow, but tonight available with PDF. Uh, now, let's talk about Wednesday. Wednesday is a remote learning day. Every day is a remote learning day for you, but Wednesday is a remote learning day for everybody that's not a junior. All juniors are, it's not the SAT. They're taking the science test, the state test on Wednesday morning and the science state test, and sorry, the history state test on Wednesday afternoon. Now, um, you have to take that test. I don't care whether you're virtual or not. At some point before you graduate, you have to have that test or you can't graduate. I mean, I'm not wrong about that. I mean, maybe you want to take it next year, but you have to take it before you graduate. So you might want to look at coming into school. You do it in your computer. So make sure you bring your a charged laptop. Um, but you might want to come into school and do it, or I don't know if you do it at home. What they say? You guys can do it at home? I don't know why they care. You're supposed to, and really isn't a time limit. You're supposed to get all the time you want. And you know what? All you got to do is take it. You don't have to pass it. I mean, you want to pass it because it, you want to do well because it does show up on your records. And people like me, I go back and look at students' records where they come into my physics class. I do look at these kind of things. So it does, it is important. But uh, to graduate, all you have to do is, is have taken it. And that's Thursday, that, that is Wednesday this week. Now, how does it affect you? It doesn't. We're still going to have this class. This, in fact, this is the class that everybody's going to watch. Um, so we have, may have some visitors that hour, but it's only going to go 30 minutes. So on Wednesday, it'll be 110 to 140. I'm not going to introduce a bunch of new stuff. We're going to go back and uh, work on stuff that we're already doing. Okay. It might be something with duck walking. Uh, we duck walk tomorrow. It might be something with collisions. It might be something on the take home, but we'll do a hodgepodge of things. I'm supposed to have instruction that day, so we'll be doing 30 minutes, but I will not be introducing anything brand new. So uh, that's Wednesday, 110 to 140, normally till two o'clock, but to 140. Okay, what else is happening this week? Uh, not much else. I ain't, I ain't going to play flashback with you on Friday. We're just going to do it. I'm going to turn the cameras off. I mean the video off. All right, then the two weeks after that, two big weeks coming up. Uh, April, uh, we're getting to April now. Uh, the for that take home test, there'll be a Zoom uh, available nine to ten a week from tonight. Uh, on then it's due a week from tomorrow by midnight. Submit it. I think that's already in the canvas. Uh, one of our last flex days of the semester is the seventh, but it doesn't really affect you. But we will have class. Uh, we'll go ahead and have class. It'll be a shortened class on. Uh, here between us. Uh, and then uh, the video key will be posted by 3 p.m. that day. Uh, if you are going to do, we'll, we'll have a poster on this in a minute, but Ask Me Tutoring, my group is doing a SAT math and verbal review uh, the 7th and 8th evening. Uh, if you're taking the SAT on the 14th, or you, you just want to take, just want to do the review. Uh, on the 8th, there's a big test. That's a big test for them. Your test is the 9th. Yeah, I got to put some note in there. I'll, I'll add this note. Uh, add, hold on. Add. I'll add virtual because it's you know usual. Your test will be available on the ninth, starting at like two in the afternoon, and you'll turn it in here. You'll turn it in by six p.m. on that Saturday, on the tenth. Okay, so you lag a day behind on these tests. And then finally, on the 12th of April, we start our last packet, the last packet of the year. That's the good news. The bad news is it's the hardest packet of the year. So uh, reap your points while you can. Uh, gather all ye points while ye may uh, now in packet five, because the points get harder in packet six. It's just the way physics is. Okay, so back to this. That then is what you're going to get 
tonight will be available. Now we did our joke Monday. Now, we spent some time talking about this. Uh, since our session this morning, uh, they freed it. So it is now finally they got, they did get it moving again. But if you missed this story, I think you've, uh, actually, I, I'm in awe of you. I, you impressed me if you had no idea what this means. That means that you don't pay any attention to news or to social media. More power to you, man. You've been meditating or hiking in the woods or something all weekend. But this has occupied the entire world's attention for about the last week. Uh, this thing, what I find interesting about it is the physics. It is so massive. 220,000 tons, um, all that inertia. I cannot think of a man-made object that has more inertia than that, uh, that just will not budge. And so I think some of the, these are the factors that must have caused it to get stuck in the first place. Uh, there was a huge gale force wind going on um, and that was uh, blowing it much more than all. They, there was apparently some problem with the engines. So I don't know whether one was out or one of the propellers wasn't working or some kind of malfunction. And finally, they didn't have the number of tugboats that they should have. There should, be, there should always be tugboats that accompany these things. Uh, there will be from now on, somebody kind of was lax on that rule. And so Egypt is the country that runs this and they got some uh, egg on their face. I'm sure the captain of this ship has been long ago <laughs> canned. Um, but why do we care, right? It's just a cargo ship. Well, this is the largest cargo ship in the world. I mean, almost. The, th this is the Evergreen, is that size. Uh, it's 100, 1,300 feet long. Well, the largest in the world was built last year. And that is this um, Al Jazeera. And that is uh, same length as this one, only a little bit wider. This is, uh, if you're standing at the goal line of the Harv and on the football field, the width would be all the way to the 30 yard line of the other team on the other side. So that is huge. Um, uh, yeah, 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 about in there, about the 40 yard line. Okay, so that's the width. And the only difference is this Algeceria is uh, about six feet wider, but it's the same otherwise. They're both the same, pretty much the same mass, 220,000 tons. That just doesn't move very easily. So um, what you need is you need some kind of torque and torque is a force crossed. It's a cross product, force crossed with uh, how far away you are from the pivot point. So they had to establish a pivot. Well, the, the back of it was stuck in mud. Uh, the propellers, the rudder, all that was stuck in mud. Here it is. And you and they have one backhoe there trying to get it out. It ain't going to work. But um, that was the problem. They, they got the front loose last night, uh, but then the, the back just would not budge. And I guess somehow today they got it, they got it working. Uh, Suez, of course, is uh, Egypt um, from the Mediterranean. It connects up. You don't have to go around Africa. Now, I, I was thinking last night, my wife and I were talking, I was thinking, well, this thing was because she asked when was it built and I thought well probably like Panama Canal right like Teddy Roosevelt days like early 1900s probably World War One. no man this Suez Canal was built in 1869 about the time of the Civil War I mean right at the Civil War in America it was one of the wonders of the world it changed everything the Suez Canal uh, so it being blocked uh, twelve percent of the uh, products. I mean, if you're if you're wondering why the part to your fridge hasn't come in, or or that or the car is enough that this these containers are huge. Are those big box containers that turn turn them into houses. They're massive. You can't just move them around. I mean, that's that they, they stack these things. They're not okay. They're not very stable. Um, they they got a lot of weight below, but they could tip. And one of the feelings was that they started unloading it. Uh, would be this. This was a TikTok, but uh, the whole thing would fall over. It could, uh, and then that would have blocked the Suez Canal for like two months. So, thank goodness, cheer, cheer! It did get apparently uh, free today. So now they're going to take it up. They'll send it off into a lake, 
get all this stuff. I mean, the problem was all these cargo ships behind them, some of them had livestock on them. They had people, they're starving, they're getting hungry. Uh, they're sitting there. It took to go around Africa's two weeks, and then you got you got fuel, you it's just it's a mess. Pirates are down there. So that was a big topic of today. All right, so I wanted to, I did talk about this too. Uh, we kind of did a little impromptu problem here. This is just a, a picture I found on the internet of a, uh, this is the last hurrah of two-dimensional motion, two-dimensional collision, but of a, this is playing nine ball. Nine ball, you, you just have the one through nine. Um, just play the solids basically uh, with the nine. Uh, but um, the cue ball comes in. So here's the cue ball to break them up. And, and whenever, you, whenever you're looking at a momentous situation involving collisions, you look at just before, just after collision, right? So just, so I went ahead and just called that the x-axis. Whatever, whatever axis it's on, you call it the x-axis. Whatever axis it's moving on. Then 90 degrees to that is the y-axis. So when the cue ball first comes in, um, I just guesstimated a, oh, we, we established that the cue ball is the same mass as the other balls. So uh, mass to mass, basically you can, you can eliminate the mass because it's the same, common to both sides, you can eliminate it. So in this case, in this special case, it is conservation of velocity. You know, Descartes was correct. It is conservation of velocity here. So if I look at the velocity of that cue ball, I guesstimated a blue arrow there, uh, times mass would be PC. Yeah, it's also V uh, um, C for cue ball. Uh, but as it comes in, it's going to then, this, this blue triangle gives birth to these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, really nine. There's one there I'm not really showing. Nine, um, really 10, because the cue ball itself bounces back. So one blue arrow gives birth to 10 right triangles. And so we have these. If we go to the Y, if we go to the X first, stay with the X first, then all the X components of these right triangles, um, let me highlight those here, give me that yellow. All of these components here, if I add them all up, they're all little arrows, they are going to equal, and this really has one too, it's more like that. All these yellow arrows are going to equal the, oh, minus, right? I'll do an orange if it's a negative. Minus, orange-ish, uh, orange. Okay, minus these arrows, they're negative. Okay, if I take the yellow minus the orange, is that it? Uh, yeah, yellow minus the orange should give you blue. So three big yellow ones. And once again, the length of the arrows is a guess, uh, just judging how far it's gone, you know, in a certain amount of time, I kind of put an arrow on it, uh, just showing relativity. But that's true in the X. Now in the Y, what's the momentum in the Y direction to begin with? What say you? What's the momentum in the y direction to begin with? Wouldn't it just be zero? Zero. So initially in the y direction, there is no momentum. And then after the collision now, we have, I'm going to call this positive. So we have this guy. That's a momentum in the y direction, pretty much. This guy this guy, and this guy. All those four must balance. If those are all positive, there must be four, or, or not necessarily four, but the lengths must add up. Is that right? Yeah, it's going that way. A little bit there. Those lengths, and then, yeah. So these three, so the three green on the left, these three must equal the same length as these four green. All right, I just want to point that out. And we're done now with, uh, with momentum.
Now we're going to look at how momentum changes with the force. So in order to do the duck walk lab, it requires a spring. And so I wanted to do a little more on springs. So um, that brings up Hooke's Law, uh, which is, and we don't really do Hooke's Law lab. I save that. I, get, I take a lot of labs from AP. So I save that for AP physics. So I'm running out of time in about 10 minutes. So this is the description we had of Robert Hooke. Uh, this is from what uh, Newton said. Remember, Robert Hooke snickered at Newton when Newton was 21. Robert Hooke was like 40 years old. But, but Isaac Newton presented optics to the Royal Society. Robert Hooke, who was always taking credit for things, said we already did that basically and, and poo pooed uh, Newton's findings, which he shouldn't have done. But he really shouldn't have done it because Newton uh, made Hooke his sworn enemy. And then when Hooke died and Newton was the president of Royal Society, he burned all of Hooke's paintings. So the only, the only vision we had of Hooke of Hook was what Newton said. And Newton said he was a bug-eyed, hunchback, balding, bad teeth old man. So that's what we think. Uh, that's according to Newton. But, but now there are two basic um, thinking on what, on what uh, Hook actually looked like. There's, there's the two possible paintings I've found of him. Two you always see, so we don't really know. Uh, this is by Lisa Jardine. If you want an interesting book on science, Curious Life of Robert Hooke is a pretty good book because he did so much. You know, he was a Renaissance man. He was doing everything. Uh, that's his drawings for his Hooke's Law apparatus. Uh, but the reason why he's the one who came up with Hooke's Law is he was the cure. He was the guy in charge of equipment for the Royal Society. So he was give, he, he'd work on all these experiments, these new ones that were coming in. Remember, Julius and Verba is their motto, and that means not by word of mouth. So they actually, for the first time ever in history, in the late 1600s, began doing experiments. I mean, Galileo did. But, and then what the heck is that thing? Um, that is the world's first microscope. Galileo, many years, decades before, in 1609, had learned, had, had developed a telescope, well, finally, um, at 1660s, we finally get somebody to think, well, wait a minute, if we can make large, if we can make far things away look bigger, can't we make little tiny things look bigger? And so they finally started looking at things on Earth. And first thing that Hook looked at, Hook was the first one to really mess with the microscope because he was in charge of equipment, uh, was a cork cell. And uh, uh, Hook said, you know, those look like, um, they look like, the places where monks sleep, and those are called cells. So I'm going to call these cells. So that's where the word cell comes from, like cellular biology. Uh, and then he wrote this book called Micrographia, and that was the bestseller of the day. Uh, it's probably one of the top bestsellers per capita uh, in history. The reason is were the drawings, and Robert Hooke was a heck of a drawer. Uh, this is one of the foldouts. Um, that is a flea, as you know. And fleas, uh, the thing about fleas are, of course, they're the reason for Black Plague, right? I mean, that all these plagues on Europe were fleas. Uh, would get into everything, get into everybody, and just, just keep, uh, you know, transmitting the flea, so transmitting the, the, the virus or whatever it is. Well, um, and they came in on rats and stuff, but the rats had fleas. And so, you may have had fleas in your house if you have a dog. We, we moved into, set, into an address here in Norman. I won't say the address publicly, but an address we first moved into. And the people had a dog, and there was nobody in the house for like a month. And so I kept getting itchy ankles. And I went over there, and I put these white socks on, put them up to my knees, looked down, and they were like half black, full of fleas. They're everywhere. And those fleas can jump. And the question is, how can they jump so high? Well, this drawing by Hook showed it. Look at that spring action here. Uh, you know, these little areas here, these little guys can get some, that's some serious spring action here. In, and it's compounded here, here, here. Look at those joints. Uh, in fact, if I was a flea, if a flea was my size, I could stand on the at Harv and jump up to the top of the Harv Stadium from the ground. 
So uh, that helped just seeing what a flea looks like because everybody had them. And then we have this guy. What the heck? Uh, this, to give you a hint, that's a hair follicle. And so what is this, what is this thing? Lice. That's a head louse. So everybody back then had head lice. But if you look at, up close at this, look at the real, this is an amazing drawing. Look up close. See those barbs? That sucker ain't gonna let go. So if you've ever had head lice, uh, one of our boys did because just at the elementary school, you know, you put all your coat and then some kid has it and everybody has it. You cannot get these things off there. So Robert Hooke developed, wrote this in a best-selling author. Uh, he did other things. Uh, here's something, one last thing we'll talk about. He did so much stuff, I'm just giving you a few things. This is the Great Fire of London of, eight, of 1666, when probably the biggest fire, half, half of London burned down. Uh, there's the castle and all, but half of it burned down. And who did they commission to rebuild it? Well, Christopher Wren, but also uh, um, Robert Hooke. Uh, he, he designed a lot of what is London today. Uh, he designed it. Uh, I remember seeing this before. So when I was walk, my wife and I walked around London in 2016, take a picture of this. This is uh, Robert Hooks, his memorial to him, uh, because he's like, thank you, man, you, you saved our city. Uh, so all that stuff, but then we don't know anything about him because he was buried essentially historically uh, by Isaac Newton, by the vindictive Isaac Newton. But the one thing, because of that anagram, right? Utensio sic vis, what they, when you unscramble it, uh, the one thing that he is known for is Hooks Law for springs. And so here's the, which is huge because it's the, it leads to elastic energy. And so in your car engine today, there are uh, probably a dozen different Hooke's Law springs. There's springs that aren't Hooke's Law, they're different shapes. And, but um, uh, basically Hooke's Law spring is the kind of spring you think of. But this is the formula for it. So the reason why it's important to at least mention it is on the Duckwalk Lab, we use a spring and the more we stretch that spring, the greater force we get. So we're applying a force to a dynamic cart and we're pulling it along with that spring. And the more that spring is stretched, the more acceleration you have. And then we look at the inertia of the cart and, and so from there we get these Newton's laws. But the, uh, so that's a combination of uh, the stretch and how stiff the spring is. That's the K value, it's called the, the spring constant, which measures stiffness. Uh, okay, it's what I want to say about that, utensio sig vis. Um, that then, if I'm looking, I don't I have a spring that I show them, but uh, we have a spring in equilibrium. That's a very happy spring. I'm going to show you this. So here's Hooke's law. Let's go down. Here's my version about five years ago. This says it all. This, this is the one thing you should know. And this will be on the last equation sheet you're going to get, the next equation sheet you're going to get. But this shows a happy spring here in the middle. Uh, that's an equilibrium. As I stretch that spring, it starts to get matter and matter. There it gets mad at the end. Or if I compress it, same idea. So it wants to reach equilibrium. So compressing or stretching that spring, now it'll do energy. It'll give my system energy. You know, if you, if you compress the spring and let it go, it'll bounce up. Well, like it, it can move a lever if you want. Um, so there's springs everywhere uh, around you. Uh, if you stretch it out, it will try and get back to its original shape. Like I open a door, spring stretches, let it go, the door shuts on its own because of Hooke's law. So um, yeah, so that's, that's enough for that. Anyway, here's the equation sheet. This is a new equation sheet. You ought to print it off if you can. At least you ought to have a file that in your Google Drive or something that just says, you know, physics equation sheets or physics help sheets. Uh, this is side 12. Um, it's, uh, it talks about in general, two-dimensional two using, we already did head to tail this on the previous sheet, but this shows, you know, using a component method. And then here's an actual with not numbers, but with these symbols uh, where if you have a green coming in here and hitting the purple, you're gonna have four angles essentially involved, right? The incident angles of each one and then the, the leaving angle. Um, so there's the equations. They're pretty complicated. Cosines for the X, sines for the Y. Uh, and then that shortcut we talked about last week, 
I said there was two conditions, actually a third condition, which means it's an elastic collision, but we could see that. So it's an elastic collision. If that's the case, then those, then the angles after collision are complementary, which helps a lot. And finally on that sheet, there's the hook's law I just showed you. Okay, so that's the new sheet for you. The last thing I wanna talk about, and I got about two minutes here, is your science classes for next year. Um, here's my recommendations. And this, this, this is a generic recommendation. Each of you will be different. And you can certainly, maybe not today because I gotta run up to the dentist, but sometime this week, you can certainly um, stop at the end and I'll talk to you individually. But here's my suggestions for next year. Um, it's not always this way, but it is for this time. AP Bio is my number one, I think would be your number one course. And the reason for that is Dr. Fernet. Uh, he's a phenomenal teacher um, with AP Bio. He's, last year was his first year, but he has taken the science department by storm. He's an amazing uh, person, amazing teacher, kids love him. He loves, loves, loves his, his subject and his students. So he's very good, Dr. Fernet. Um, he's Canadian, he may not be going back to Canada, so that's the only thing to worry about. If you sign up for AP Bio and then you find out in, say, August that Dr. Fernet is gone, then get out. <laughs> then, because then, they, then you're going to get a first year AP Bio teacher. That's probably not going to be a good experience for you. In that case, I would go to the number two option, which is AP Physics. I think you can do both, to be honest with you, you can do both. Uh, but AP Physics, and I, either I'll be teaching that or it could be Pentecost. I think you may be in Africa, though. So, uh, but the other, another guy coming in uh, who's a physics guy, so he would be good too. And he works closely with me. So, either way, I think AP Physics would be good for you next year. You have to be in calculus at least. Be in calculus. Uh, apes is always you can always take Apes. AP Environmental Science. Um, you can fit in any, any schedule. It's not a tremendous amount of work. Uh, it's not a typical AP class. Uh, you're in there, Amy Cook is the teacher and she's, she's committed and passionate and she's getting really good at it. So uh, she's the one, uh, the, that, that course can go anywhere. AP Chem is my fourth choice on that. Uh, I, taught, I taught AP Chem for 12 years. Uh, that's, one, that's one of these why even if I taught it next year, it'd still be number four uh, because it is, you're, okay, real quick. Your, your chance of passing an AP test is the best with AP physics. That is your best chance of passing an AP test and getting a four or five on it. AP bio maybe next, depending on how much work, that's a lot of work. Apes you can do well on, but AP chemistry is tough. Um, when I taught it, we would get some threes, occasional fours. When I taught it for a third year, we got fours and fives, but it takes three years. So, um, I mean, Miranda can tell me, she's not in here today, but she might have a different idea her sister got five, I think, on it. But uh, AP Chem is just really tough to get a good score on the, on the test. If you just absolutely love chemistry, okay. Physio now, if you're going to med school, it's not an AP course, but it's probably, if you're going to do try med school, you probably ought to do it. Physio Nat. And, and Mr. Cox is amazing. He's funny. And it's, it's not really a hard class. You'll, you'll get your A, whatever you're looking for. Um, but he's a, he's, a, he's a good guy. He knows a lot, too. There's other courses out there, you know, CSI is great. I, I, I would take uh, that, take forensics. It's very good, uh, if Ms. Shaw's there, especially. Uh, there's, uh, there's astronomy, that's, that's fine. Uh, kids like it, zoology is good. So there's other courses, I'm just giving you the main courses. Okay, uh, so now I've got to stop. So I've got to get to the dentist and I will let you guys go. Normally I'd sit and wait, but we got to go. So um, I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Have a good one.